Good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Daniel Teasley. I am the head of strategic marketing for Millipore Sigma's Vectors and Biologics CDMO business, and I have the privilege of moderating today's Science Slam, which will cover innovation in the AAV vector space. Uh, we'll have our panelists each come up, give a few minute presentation, and then we'll have a group uh, discussion and hopefully leave some time for questions from the audience at the end. TJ, you want to come up? This is TJ Craddock, CSO of Excision Biotherapeutics. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, my name is TJ Craddock. I am the CSO at Excision Biotherapeutics. And today I'll present a little of the work we've done at Excision and across the field to improve patient outcomes by engineering and assaying AAV payloads. I want to start by thanking the team at Excision and our collaborators uh, who put this all together. Excision is dedicated exclusively to focus on viral infectious diseases. Uh, I'm always perplexed when we got two sides to point to, but we're the, the first and only technology in history to remove HIV from humanized animals and generate a cure. And we've got positive long-term primate data and just published our second biodistribution and safety study in rhesus macaques. EBT 101 for HIV is in phase one clinical trials, uh, finishing cohort one into continuing to dose and escalate. Uh, we've taken this technology that we put together for EBT 101 and demonstrated and now applying to the large patient populations for hepatitis B, uh, herpes simplex, and JC virus. The left diagram I, I probably showed for about 20 years uh, in gene editing, where we've got uh, a single cut that's repaired by non-homologous end joining, which generally leads to small insertions or deletions, we call it indels. And these often uh, you are very small in size and could lead to viral escape. And so I'm excited now, after those 20 years, to describe what we're doing at Excision, which is multiplex editing, using uh, two or more guides. And in the case of HIV, we've got two guides that cut in three locations. This gives us three chances to cut three different excisions uh, for viral inactivation. And we have one guide that cuts at the well-conserved five prime long terminal repeat and three prime long terminal repeat, and a second guide that cuts in GAG. And so if any two of these cut, we have 1,000 nucleotides, 8,000 nucleotides, or 9,000 nucleotides removed, vastly different than a single cut where we could have a few nucleotides changed. And to do this, Excision developed its proprietary bioinformatics pipelines. And this is one of the reasons I'm very excited to be at a company really focused on, on viral targeting, because this initial step is, is very critical, working with the virologist to really curate and assemble the viral genome so you know exactly what you're targeting. Develop the consensus sequences, uh, and then to determine how well these are conserved to pick the, the highest conserved sites. And then the fourth step is actually also critically important, and this is a step we followed on recently, where we understand DNA repair and cleavage to come up with the target sites that will lead to the largest, the highest amount of excision. And then, of course, we, you know, for the last 20 years, we continued to look across the genome to understand uh, how different our target sites are from anywhere in the human genome. And if you uh, want to hear more of this, I've got a talk online from World CRISPR Day and, and a year ago at the ASGCT, where we showed that our guides are very different from the human genome. Very few sites are even nominated by the bioinformatics methods. So when we get to the final step, when we're done doing the bioinformatics, we come up with very highly conserved and very specific guides that we expect to have high activity. And then when we go into preclinical testing and, and into the long-term follow-up, we can use these sites that are identified to do our next generation sequencing. And at this point for EBT 101, we have yet to observe in any of these studies any signs of unintended edits, which is certainly a very important step for, for us in the field. Um, and we take these programs um, that we applied to EBT 101, and now we're, we're using them on, on herpes, uh, hepatitis B, where we've got certainly large patient populations, and JC virus. So to do that, we, we think about delivery. And as mentioned, excision's all in on, on viral targeting. But we're uh, open to different ways of delivery. And so for certain indications, let's say hepatitis B, where there's strong evidence for liquid nanoparticles to deliver to the hepatocytes, then we could go with non-viral delivery. But for other indications, then we, we could go with AAV. And so, as mentioned, we, we've got dual guides and, and AV, and so I don't think I have to explain to this crowd that we've had tremendous success with AAV. Um, and I pulled this 2021 study because it talks about the number of, of different studies for gene replacement, gene addition, and in 2021, a very small number of gene editing trials, but I'm excited that that number is increasing. 
And so in this talk, I'm, I'm talking about ways, especially coupled with our early R&D, we can decrease the challenges of supply, cost, and quality. And so in this talk, I'll focus on uh, working on the payload, which simplistically we can think of AAV uh, also including manufacturing and capsids, but the capsid part will be followed you know, in the following talks. So I'll start on the payload development. And again, one of the take home messages I'm trying to describe here is how important it is to start with early R&D and couple that with CMC manufacturing. Because you can improve the activity that could decrease the total titer you need, which can increase the number of patients treated. And so things you can look at are trying to be within the packaging limit of AAV, the arrangement, uh, transgene, codon, you know, these things can drive increased expression of your transgene. But you also need to worry about the stuffer, plasmid backbones, and then inverted terminal repeats. And so this is no more, more evident than the example I'll talk about for gene editing. And the choice of nucleases and guides is really important. We spend, obviously, a lot of time with the bioinformatics that I described, coming up with the most effective way to target and excise. And therefore, this is, this is really important first step to begin with. Then working again on, on codon expression, uh, CPG elimination, and then the arrangement. And so mentioned we're multiplex editing, which gives us uh, three expression cassettes. And so rearranging those is something we found to be very important. Um, as described in this one publication, uh, since I don't have our data to show in this particular case, but um, they rearranged these different cassettes and saw dramatic differences uh, in the percentage of full length and in the nuclease activity. And similarly, when we were even just looking at the expression of one of the two guide RNAs, by changing it up in the plasmids, we could see dramatic changes in how much guide RNA is expressed, which is obviously an indicator of activity. Um, but also, by, by looking at different ways of arranging the payload, we saw a tremendous increase, about 12x increase in viral titer from our initial constructs to the construct number three in this. So this is certainly a, a, a chance for you to look at these kind of projects early in R&D and see a tremendous change in your manufacturing. And so to do these, these type of engineering, you, you need the assays to read them out. And so there are multiple assays that can be used in process development to improve AAV activity, uh, homogeneity, and titer. And certainly this is also very important in the regulatory steps. And these sequencing assays can look for unintended uh, packaging of, of the vector bacteria or cellular genes, but also can be used, especially with the long-range sequencing, to look for full-length payloads, uh, mapping truncations, and helping you troubleshoot and choose the best arrangement. And so here's, uh, from this other study, some of the long-range sequencing, identified a few sites and, and helped them choose the best one. And we similarly have, have done this type of work. And we saw, again, with these constructs two and three, a 4x increase uh, in the full length. So we see both an increase in titer and the percentages that are, are, are full-length uh, AAV constructs. So we're excited about that. So I want to... Um, so you know, draw this to a conclusion by talking about the importance of having coordinated research interactions as early as possible between the research team, uh, CMC manufacturing, uh, so that you can allow these readouts to improve your AV activity to make sure it is all, you, you know, homogeneity, it has high homogeneity and high titer. And certainly we can understand that. Of course, the converse is if you wait late in the game and go back and change some of these, you know, uh, key essential parts of the payload, you'll have to redo these type of studies. Um, another uh, point I want to certainly make out, make a strong case for is that if you establish these potency assays early, they'll come into play both for R&D and preclinical work and really speed CMC efforts. So as soon as you can get your uh, potency assays and other key assays in place, it'll certainly speed your efforts to the clinic. Um, and I hope I made a little bit of a case that improving the cargo can greatly aid production, delivery, and therapeutic outcomes. And as, as the topic of this title, you know, we can speed commercialization. So with that, I certainly would like to thank you and our team at Excision. Uh, this is a little bit of outdated photo. Um, and I last, uh, I've got this question probably two or three times last night. Our research operations are located in Watertown, Massachusetts, just across, you know, a couple miles from our old lab in Cambridge. And let you know that uh, if you want to come visit us there or uh, if you're looking, we, we are hiring. Thank you. Our next speaker uh, is Rodolphe Clerval from Cove Therapeutics. Okay. <clears throat> so, thank you. Um, 
for those who are not there an hour ago. <laughs> we are a delivery uh, company in genetic medicine uh, based on a unique platform called Alligator for advanced ligand conjugate vectors. Uh, we have developed this platform from the uh, University of Nantes in the west of France, where uh, we have focused initially on conjugating rationally designed ligand onto AVs, and we have recently expanded the platform to LNPs. Um, so what is the platform and why we are uh, differentiated to other technology? First, we are uh, using existing and clinically validated vectors, such as AV. Uh, we have been able to basically conjugate any serotype and commercially available LNPs. And our objective is really to leverage on those vectors uh, as there's a lot of CMC expertise and even manufacturing capabilities as well as safety database for LNPs available. And the idea is really to, instead of reinventing the wheel, to leverage those vectors by functionalizing these vectors in order to improve their uh, efficacy, like tissue tropism, as well as their uh, safety by improving the targeting uh, versus detargeting of, of, uh, uh, of target tissues. So the um, technology is inspired from antibody drug conjugate, but we are actually using a very different chemistry. It's a unique chemistry that we have developed and patented, enabling a one-step chemistry uh, for binding covalently rationally designed ligand onto the surface of uh, the vectors. So we can play with different end groups, and I will elaborate on this. And uh, what we can do, and what is very appealing for many companies, is we can modify existing candidates that have, de that have been developed, for instance, on AV9, AV8, or AV2, or been developed on existing LNPs. The other very important aspect is we are not uh, screening billions of capsid in vivo on different spaces to find the right one. We are selecting and groups for which there's an established uh, structure activity relationship between the moiety we are putting on the tip of the ligands and a human receptor. So what we have seen so far, at least on retinal tissue and CNS, is we have a very good translation between redundant and NHP data. So we have started uh, this development uh, with small molecule ligands, uh, which were designed to target the eye and the CNS. Those ligands were based on, on uh, carbohydrates, on different carbohydrate derivatives. And we have expanded that uh, ligand technology to peptide-based ligands. And uh, I will elaborate a little bit on, on what we are doing now. Basically, we're expanding that technology to aptamers and other uh, molecules. The idea being to target uh, a large uh, panel of tissues by, by designing such ligand and binding those ligands onto AV and LNPs. So we have, on, on specifically on conjugated AV, we have developed initially conjugated AV2 uh, for local administration, improving uh, spreading and transductions for uh, intraparenchymal administrations in the brain and subretinal administrations. We have uh, then moved to a CSF route of administrations in uh, in, uh, in the CNS uh, uh, area uh, because there's a huge uh, need for improving uh, existing vectors in that route of administration, and I will show you more data. And we are now moving to IV administrations of different conjugated vectors using ligands that have been specifically designed to target, for instance, the BBB or uh, other tissue that could be uh, uh, reached by the IV route of administration. So this is an example of what we have developed, it's a conjugated AV2 for intraparenchymal administrations. We have demonstrated in the previous NHP studies that we have a better expression, a stronger expression on the spreading from the stuatum to the substantia nigra with this vector compared to AV2 and AV5. And we have used that vector to actually uh, transduce neurons and uh, augmenting GKs, which is one of the uh, uh, reduce enzyme in certain subtype of, of Parkinson disease called GB1 Parkinson. And in these studies, what you see is from the putamen administration in the brain, we have been able to augment the GKS activity. This is wild type uh, NHP. We have been able to augment that uh, GKS activity by a factor of up to 15 fold using a pretty low dose because we were below 10 to the 11 VG per uh, brain administrated. 
and, and we have seen a, a great correlation between the GKS activity and GKS protein expression. And again, the spreading from the putamen to globus pallidus, substantia nigra, and caudate nucleus. What we are doing now is developing those new ligands for a uh, IV administration. The first uh, target we have selected is a, a well-established structure activity, uh, a well-established peptide with, with known structure activity relationship. This uh, transferrin receptor binding peptide that have been selected because this peptide binds both the human and the rodent uh, transferrin receptors. We have been able to uh, uh, synthesize this uh, or cell of, of ligands using the transferrin peptide and to conjugate the ligands onto AV. And we have been focusing on AV2 and AV9 uh, initially, but we can, we can certainly uh, conjugate other serotypes. Um, we have in vitro data demonstrating we uh, improve transductions of cell line expressing transferrin receptors. And we are preparing in vivo studies to demonstrate we can um, basically target uh, tissues expressing transferrin, such as endothelial cell for uh, crossing the BDD and uh, skeletal muscle. We have, uh, as I said, recently expanded our technology to LNPs. The reason why is, uh, as you know, anyone knows, LNPs have a, a restricted uh, tropism to the, to the liver. Uh, we see that you know, there's many companies developing new lipids and, and new nanoparticle uh, for extrahepatic uh, tropism. Uh, others are focusing on improving uh, existing commercial LNPs, and this is what we are doing. But we are doing a different way. We are actually conjugating LNPs after formulation, uh, which is a different approach from others. And we are using the same chemistry, or one of the chemistry we are using for AV, which is not the classical malamide uh, chemistry, which has limitations in terms of stability and, and CMC and scalability. We, we are using a chemistry which uh, enable to uh, conjugate a variety of ligands, and on LNPs we have been able to conjugate with uh, different uh, glycan-based uh, ligand as well as uh, peptide-based ligand on, on uh, LNPs without changing the stability of LNPs. And uh, we are currently uh, running uh, in vitro and in vivo study to confirm the improved um, a property, biological property of, of those LNPs. Um, internally, we have used our technology to develop our own pipeline of uh, neurogenative disorders with basically two programs or three programs. One uh, focusing on GB1 Parkinson disease, and I already provided some, some data on this one, and as well another programs using TFEB as a target, which is a master regulator of uh, autophagy. And we have already uh, positive data on two preclinical models of Parkinson's disease on uh, MSA, demonstrating uh, reductions of uh, protein aggregations and improvement of uh, phenotype in uh, F53 mice model. <clears throat> and here we are using our conjugated vectors, the objective being to be very targeted on basal ganglia with a good spreading on those tissues to deliver uh, the TFEB uh, uh, transgene. So in summary, um, we are a, a, a hybrid uh, company uh, focusing on a platform called Alligators. We are leveraging this platform with uh, actually not three, but four ongoing partnership uh, with uh, NASDAQ listed uh, uh, companies and, and large pharma. Uh, we have signed our first partnership for a gene editing. And uh, internally, we are developing our own pipeline. The company is, uh, is based in Paris and we are happy to discuss any interest in collaborating with our conjugated uh, AV and conjugated LNP te technologies. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our final panelist and speaker, Ann Song from 4D Molecular Therapeutics. Thank you, Daniel. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Ann Song, Chief Development Officer for the Molecular Therapeutics. Um, in preparing this talk, I found it's actually harder to give a 10 minutes talk than 30 minutes one. 
Right, so hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I'll give you a flavor of what we're doing at 4D try to, to um, boldly innovate to unlock the full potential of AAV-based gene therapy. So 4DMT is um, headquarters in uh, Emeryville, California. We are both a technology platform and the product company. Our technology platform is directed evolution, which I'll get to a little bit later. And we build our pipeline based on vector modularity approach, or you can call it platform approach. Uh, right now, we have three clinical stage vectors in three therapeutic areas, ophthalmology, pulmonology, and uh, cardiology. And then we have five clinical candidates for seven patient populations, and our overall strategy is to build a fully integrated genetic medicines company. Not only we have internal capabilities for preclinical and clinical development, we also have our own manufacturing capabilities, including GMP facilities. So here's our pipeline. As you can see, for a, a size of company of 140 people, this is very impressive. We're very busy. And we have a pretty strong ophthalmology portfolio based on R100. This is a novel uh, intravitreal uh, delivered vector that shows great um, uh, delivery and transfection of retina uh, cells. So we have 4150 for large market indications like wet AMD and DME. 175 for geographic atrophy. We also have 125 and 110 for rare diseases. Our pulmonology pipeline uh, portfolio is built upon um, A101. This is the aerosol delivered vector into the lung and have shown good lung cell transduction uh, profile. Finally, um, our 4D310 product for Fabry disease um, was built upon uh, vector C102, which has shown good heart uh, tropism. So um, just looking back, um, AAV-based gene therapies have shown actually a lot of successes. Um, as we talked about earlier today, you know, listed here are approved gene therapy products, some early ones and then some recent ones. Very exciting. All these approved products are built upon uh, wild type or natural occurring um, AAV capsids. You know, you can say that they're working fine, right? So what's wrong with them? However, we all know that these wild type AAV capsids have their limitations. They could have limited, dis uh, limited delivery limited transaction, when they're used in high doses, um, you could see increased inflammation and toxicity. And then they could be uh, vulnerable for neutralizing antibodies because human beings have pre-existing immunity to these wild-type capsids. So um, by and large, these wild-type um, cap capsids are used mostly um, in rare disease or niche uh, disease indications. At 4D, we aim to innovate novel vectors to overcome the limitations of these wild type uh, capsids. Our solution is to use directed evolution approach. So what, is what, so what is directed evolution? It is a method used in protein engineering to steer proteins or nucleic acids to a, a, a end user defined goal. Um, so a gene can be subjected to uh, runs of mutagenesis, um, selection, and, applica and amplification to finally um, uh, find your novel variants. So as you know that in 2018, the development of uh, these methods was awarded Nobel Prize in chemistry to Francis Arnold for evolution of enzymes 
and George Smith and uh, Gregory Winter for uh, fish display. So um, Arnold once says, direct evolution is the most powerful biological design process because as an alternative method to rational design, you can actually uh, discover and uh, result in novel and desired variant without fully understanding the relationship between structure and function relationship. So this is at 4D how we use the principle of direct evolution to discover novel uh, AAV capsid. So we take conventional or natural, uh, naturally occurring capsids, the cap gene, and we diversify the heck, out, uh, the heck out of it. So you could generate a large variety of AAV cap uh, gene sequences by introducing uh, mutations, peptide insertions, a variety of molecular biology techniques. And you package these uh, different variants into different libraries. So be before we use the libraries, we actually go to the, the drawing board and um, go through what kind of disease we want to target. And in order to target this disease, what's the dose we want to administer? What's the root of, the, the root of administration? Because we, we want to, to use less invasive and more convenient, more tolerable uh, routes for our patients. And then we come up with, we call it target vector profile. And then we select either our full library of AAV uh, sequences or a selection of the libraries and then we go to non-human primates, use the root of, the, of administration, and inject these uh, libraries into animals. And then we harvest the desired tissue uh, for targeting, and, and then we recover the, uh, the, the vector genome from that particular tissue. And then we amplify them, identify them. Uh, sometimes we actually re-diversify these capsids, and then we go through these iterative runs of selection and amplification, and finally, um, we can uh, result the desired novel capsid variants that you know, really uh, uh, fulfill our target. So um, here I'll show you one example where we use this approach to discover R100 to overcome the uh, challenges associated with the retina transgene, de transgene delivery. So as we all know that um, the retina tissue is really an uh, opportune tissue for gene therapy because it's small in size, uh, relatively enclosed, has a stable and non-dividing uh, cell population, immune privileged, and targeting it will have limited exposure uh, we have limited systemic, ex uh, systemic exposure. However, um, the, wild type, uh, the, the wild type vectors uh, has been challenging to be used uh, via intravitreal injection because you know, the, these uh, wild type uh, vectors uh, will have a hard time to transit the vitreous uh, space and get through and penetrate through multiple layers of the retina. So as such, um, using wild type uh, vectors, subretina injection is, is, is used most of the time, right? However, using subretina injection would require the detachment of the photoreceptor from the um, pigment epithelium, so that could have um, some complications. And also, one injection can only get to a very small area of the retina, 5% maybe. So it would require probably higher dose that will come with complication of um, increased risk of inflammation or other um, uh, undesired effect. So to overcome these imitations, we use the, di the, the, the directed evolution approach, which I described earlier, to discover R100 so R100 has been shown to effectively transit through 
the um, vitreous uh, space and penetrate the, uh, the barrier into the, the retina and being able to transduce the major cell types within retina and then different layers as well. Obviously, we have um, a, a large, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, package of data to show that, but today, with the, our limited time, I'll show you two pieces of data. So here, shown are representative images of a non-human non primate um, retina cells after an IVT administration of R100-based uh, reporter gene. So this is a EGFP reporter gene driven by a ubiquitous promoter, CAG, and then after three weeks of uh, administration at the dose of 1E12 VG per I. As you can see that um, so GFP is shown in green and antibody anti-GFP in red and then with other um, uh, markers. As you can see that the transgene can be really robustly expressed in all different areas of the retina, central and periphery, and then different major types of um, cells in the retina, including retina pigment epithelium, um, ep epithelial cells, photoreceptors, and then retina ganglia cells. So this really effective transduction enabled the low dose uh, of, of use. So I guess I'm out of my, my time. <laughs> um, so I have one more piece of data to show, but you know, um, basically the, the effective transduction of R100 enabled really a low dose use in our clinical studies and our phase one, two clinical data show that um, the activity can be seen as low as um, a dose of 6E9 to 3E10. Uh, so um, hopefully that one example can show you that we are really uh, developing the next generation of novel AAV vectors that can enable more effective delivery, transduction, and transgene expression. So I'm going to stop here and then welcome the rest of the panel to here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you all. Really insightful talks and, and a lot of different kinds of innovation around AAV. I'm wondering what's the point at which you decide that a more typical standard AAV gene therapy approach with a natural AAV serotype isn't sufficient for a particular indication that you're pursuing? And, and what pushes you kind of over that decision point uh, to, to making that? <laughs> you want to start with that one, Ann? Sure, I'll start with that one. Um, so when 4D was set up, um, we already knew that although, you know, the wire type are working well, but we knew their limitations and we want to discover something new. So from the, from the get-go, right? Uh, in particularly for ophthalmology, we knew that at the time a lot of the delivery is through the subretina, right? And we think that it's not convenient, it's risky for uh, patients, and, and the transaction is probably not efficient because it's a very small area. So we wanted to start out by discovering a vector that can, can do, we can do intravitreal injection. So, so we just like set up that goal and our whole discovery is based on that goal. Yeah. Did you like I, I, yeah, I can chime in as well. As I mentioned, we have a biodistribution and safety study looking at rhesus macaques and see that AAV9 gets to the tissues and cells that are known viral reservoirs. So in this case, we, we did these, these studies in, in non-human primates and saw that we did get into those tissues in both the biodistribution and looked to see evidence of activity. So we knew we were expressing we knew that there were actually excision going on. And so if we had not had those results, then we would say, ah, you know, here's, here's an example where we, we'd have to go on to look either at a different stereotype or, or some other alternate strategies. Um, and I think conversely, we also, um, I, I didn't go into as much, but we've done the bioinformatics, we've done this, the sequencing studies. If you had off-target uh, delivery and had some, some 
off-target effects, either transgene expression or in the case of gene editing, then in addition to uh, making sure you got to the right cells, you want to make sure you're not going to ones where you're having unintended edits. So there's two kind of things that I think would drive this type of process. If your data didn't support use of, of the way that you'd first identified. So we, um, w when we started with the platform, the, the company Cova, the previous experience with uh, traditional AV, AV5 actually for one of of the historical program we we have developed up to phase two on. This program was for a, a retinitis pigmentosa, subretinal administration. So in this part, particular disease, AV5, and I guess it's true for other serotypes, for subretinal administration is good enough, let's say. But we knew that uh, for other indication in the eye, uh, we would need a vector with uh, a, either an improved route of administration, like IVT or supracroidal. So we are exploring supracroidal administrations of mm -hmm. conjugated vectors with one of our partner. And, and for uh, the subretinal administration, we knew that for certain diseases like Stargard disease, we need vectors that are able to spread in the retina. So we have developed the conjugated AV2 for that purpose first. And we have, have I haven't shared the data today, but we have demonstrated we have a, a, a spreading of, of the conjugated AV2 in the whole retina. And then from there, we say, what is the other disease, uh, what are the other tissue where there's a current limitations of spreading vectors after local administrations. And actually, basal ganglia in the brain was one of those uh, diseases such as Parkinson disease, and that was the experience of, of companies like Voyagers and others that demonstrated that after neurosurgery, when you uh, inject uh, uh, AV2, for instance, you, those vectors basically stick at the site of administrations and need to spread to other structures really to deliver uh, at the right place. And, and this is where we have tested the conjugated AV2 and we have been very pleased to see we can spread, like we have seen in the RTL, we have a vector spreading in those tissues. So that was the decision why we, we have moved those, those vectors from traditional AV to conjugated one. So I'm wondering about the implementation of novel technologies and how that impacts the, the workflow from early PAD through clinic and manufacturing and, and ultimately commercialization. Do you have best practices to kind of prepare for these impacts ahead of the curve? And TJ, you started to get at this in your talk. Maybe you want to add to that? Yeah, I, one part that I mentioned in the talk is is making sure you've got the assays in place uh, as early as possible. And, and having been on the research side uh, for quite a long time, that, that was certainly something that uh, even when we started programs and tech transferred them out of academic into industry or on the other side in industry, it was really good to, to have those. And, I think the take home is also if we've got these complex projects, then you have to pay more attention to those. And if there are multiple elements that you're changing up, then make sure that your assay is ready for them. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I think one of the things that certainly pays off is just to get into that or, or to get going on, on your final product as early as possible, identify it, having the assays to build and test. You also talked about early cross functional collaborations as, as being something essential. Can you? Do you, do you think there's areas that are most important to focus on as you're thinking about doing those kind of early collaborations? Uh, certainly, I, I mean, I mentioned the one, the potency assays, and that, that's certainly a clear one, but I think as you're trying to make decisions, in the case of gene editing, nuclease, target site, um, whichever our choice, um, sometimes we realize that as, as we go into the, in the clinical setting that maybe we're gonna have difficulty in, in the readouts, and that um, I know even in one, one particular choice where we had two different strategies to go forward, uh, one uh, was just much more harder, harder to read out. Um, and so having figured that out fairly early, uh, didn't go down that hole and realize that, oh, we, we're not gonna be able to uh, understand how well we're treating these patients because we, we, we would have a confusing uh, way to, uh, without trying to figure out how to, how to say this uniformly without identifying what we were doing. But uh, the, a way, you know, so we, we were able to uh, learn that lesson early uh, and therefore put our strategies towards a, a, a target that was effective and could, could be read out. And I would like to add something. We all know that um, manufacturing AAV gene therapy is challenging, right? it's difficult. So one really brilliant decision that was made at 4DMT early on was to establish our own manufacturing capability. So now we're really uh, making our GM, GLP materials and then clinical materials as well. 
And then also facilitate this really early on collaboration between preclinical development teams and then manufacturing teams because once we discover a novel vector, um, you know, we would have our technical operations colleagues to make those viruses with, with, for us. So and they will get a first hand of experience of how to manufacture. So manufacturing ability has become part of the evaluation of these uh, new capsids. So that early collaboration really facilitated our IND you know, filing process and then later clinical development processes. So, well. so it's built into your selection. Yeah, basically it's building into our selection, characterization, and, you, and manufacturing kind of a capability assessment as well. well I certainly have learned the other way. Our, our initial projects a uh, few decades few uh, decades and generations ago, we were making zinc finger nucleases that targeted uh, hepatitis B virus while I was at the University of Iowa. And we were using an academic core. We didn't get a chance to, to make small batches to test out what was going to be. We had very low titers. So I, from the early game uh, of, of trying to take zinc finger nucleases in mm -hmm. at AAV, learned you know, how important and, and difficult it is. And, and so you know, the earlier you can get it and yeah. figure these things out, the, the higher your chance of success. Yeah, yeah. so okay. in, in, all, in all situations with the conjugation, technology, manufacturability was critical uh, to demonstrate that we can really scale up that process to, uh, to uh, GMP-like conditions because the promises of, of conjugation is we can really basically piggyback on existing manufacturing uh, capabilities for AV and that is critical. Uh, there's uh, you know, many new AV uh, vectors uh, coming from directed evolution and others for which there's potentially good biological properties but they are just no, people can't manufacture them uh, because they are. Uh, so I know that many of those companies are, are selecting at the end of the day uh, AVs that could be manufactured. In our case, and we have already done that, we can directly you know, use AV9, uh, and we have already conjugated AV9 from different sources of, of manufacturing. You, some produce with uh, uh, 293 cells or, or some use uh, produce on baculovirus uh, process. And what we have done is we have transferred our conjugation technology to GMP-like facilities with one of our CDMO, and, and, and it works. It works because we do the conjugation right after the last step of, of chromatography and before the filtration step for full finish. And, and by doing so, we are not actually impacting the yield of, of, of production. So that's uh, one of the big advantage of, of that technology. Smart engineering, I'd say. Um, between the three of you and numerous other companies here, lots of different kinds of innovation, have you thought about how you might combine technologies and how you might do a combinatorial approach to, to extract more benefit than your technology alone uh, can do? So it's, it's, it's totally in our plan. It's, uh, our technology is really orthogonal to directed evolution. So we are talking with uh, few companies that have developed novel vectors through uh, directed evolutions or AI-based technology where we are basically complementing the property with conjugation. So for instance, uh, working on uh, liver detargeted AV capsid, which you know, most of the liver detargeted AV capsid has proven to have you know, reduced property on the targeted organs. So by adding one ligands to retarget properly uh, this AV, we can you know, benefit from the work that have been done on, uh, on the capsid by directed evolution and adding the conjugation to improve. So it's, it's we, and we are talking with, about that with other companies that have already integrated directed evolution. I'm talking with Big Pharma and want to combine the directed evolution capsid with the conjugation technology. Any, any combinatorial ideas, TJ? Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I, I had one kind of slide where I was talking about payload manufacturing and, and capsid and such, and, and those, in some situations, can be swapped up. We're like, all right, we've got the same payload. We're, we're going in and we've tested with multiple different uh, capsids or multiple different ways of going forward. So, you know, th there's plenty of examples where one uh, developed a way forward uh, and then uh, was able to try different capsids, different AV, different manufacturing. Or you know we assume even different ways of adding targeting um, and not having to go back in. And if you were able to detarget, then you'd say, ah, then we don't have to do this other process that we we'd baked in. And so there, you know, you, 
there are instances where it would save you steps, but in other cases where you can directly use the same uh, methodology that you developed to uh, design, show efficacy, manufacture, and then, and then combine it with the other technology. So I, I think that that's clearly, uh, which I guess is the way this question's going, yes, these are combinatorial. Yeah, so if I just add, to me, you know, a good AAV vector is just a delivery vehicle, right? It can deliver a lot of things, it can deliver the right gene for genetic mutations, it can express recombinant proteins as you wish, it can deliver gene editing tools as well, right? So a good delivery system can be used in, for many purposes. So to me, that can be really combined in many different ways. So the, the thing we keep talking about is if we, let's say, moving from HIV to HSV, all we're changing is two guide sequences, so 40 nucleotides out of, of four, you know, 5K. So less than 1% is, is, is changing, so it'll be the same manufacturing, the same, you know, mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll get to piggyback on what we previously demonstrated to go after different targets. And so the expectation is, is that there won't be a difficulty for, for continuing to do this, and, and much of the, of the process will be the same. So sometimes new technologies simplify the process. Sometimes they add complexity. Is there an instance when the bleeding edge becomes too much, where the innovation disadvantages start to outweigh whatever you were trying to get at in the first place as a benefit? So that, that was one of our uh, fear when we started uh, that, that platform, because we have seen I mean, conjugation of AV is not something we have invented at Cove. Others have done that. And, and when you look at uh, what mostly academic groups have done is by changing the capsid structure, introducing a natural amino acid, or introducing other way to couple uh, molecules at the surface. And that is making the process extremely complicated. When you try to introduce a natural amino acid, you either have to grow your cell with a natural amino acid in the medium or to engineer the cell. So from the very beginning, working with bioconjugation expert, I mean, combining the AV group at the University of Nantes and the bioconjugation group was really, we do not touch the capsid. We design the chemistry to make it very simple and we need one step. If we multiply the step of conjugation, like there's many click chemistry that could enable to do what we do with two steps, it's already too much. You had multi-step of filtration, you will lose uh, basically 90% of your product at the end of the process. So make it very simple, uh, that was critical, and demonstrating we can scale up that to a GMP-like condition in an external uh, provider, that was uh, what, you know, uh, was necessary to convince now biotech and pharma to work with us on this process. I, I did think one one aspect that it, this this crowd is probably the the, the ones to answer. We uh, our lab at Georgia Tech and our group had the first DD PCR machine for gene editing, and then, so we developed a bunch of methods. But when these were tech transferred to the company and then looking to, to t you know for CROs, they all didn't have that technology yet. And so that's why it's great to be you know, having this audience here to be working with to make sure we can develop state-of-the-art uh, technologies and, and then make sure that we can apply them in the clinical setting. So a lot of activity in the field around capsid engineering and delivery innovation with AAV, right? That's what this was all about. Do you expect these innovations to matriculate through to other viral vectors or modalities? Rudolph, we see this with LNPs with, with your organization's work. Is there a broader applicability for, for all of these? Oh yeah, I think at the end of the day it will be not only one technology that will uh, uh, be used, but the combination of, of many, uh, uh, and I hope the conjugation will be part of them. Uh, we see very elegant work around the viral-like particles uh, being done currently. Uh, so, you know, we, we are looking, we are looking at, at the field, but you know, the thing is, and it's also target tissue specific. Uh, if I take the example of BB crossing, which is really something where we have seen over the last three years a lot of attention, a lot of deals around those AV crossing the BBB. I mean, if you want to have an AV crossing the BBB, you don't need to have only an AV crossing the BBB. You have to have an AV which is fully detargeted for the liver at the dose when at the dose which is efficient for crossing the BBB. So, you know, this is one issue. You have to be sure that your AV has 
an acceptable immunogenicity? And, and, and you know, this is another key question on elephant in the room when you look at the data from different uh, companies where, you know, there are AV9 der derived capsid. Uh, we play with epitopes to create new variants. Wh what is the immunogenicity of those vectors? So, you know, it's, it's, it's and, and also, of course, manufacturability. So it's, it's, you know, you have to tick all those boxes before you have a clinically uh, ready capsid to be tested. So I'm curious, TJ, the inclusion of two cargos, right? That's, that's, right. does that impact process consistency? Does that impact the regulatory approach? Are you pursuing PAD for transgenes independently or is that a unified approach uh, that you move forward with? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. We, we certainly have to use different methods to, to look at the expression of the guide RNAs, which are, are, are a different kind of promoter than the than the, the main transgene, and those are, those are assayed differently. And depending whether in past lives we did adoptive cell therapy, we could assay the, the cells before they were introduced, or in our case with excision, where we're doing in vivo, we've got a, a range of different assays that, that help us characterize uh, how these are expressed. And so, yes, uh, they answer your question, that having multiple uh, uh, products with, within, you know, expression products within our uh, expression cassette means we've, we've got three different things that you could assay. And, and sometimes you can measure both guides, uh, but in, in many instances you want to have a specific one to, to look at it. Uh, as I described, we've got different arrangements and, and we want to have those uh, separable assays to, to really get the readout to, to do that. So I, I showed only one out of the three readouts. Yeah. Uh, the, others, the others, we also saw dramatic effects. So yes, you, you want to make sure that it, your assays can really tease apart uh, each of the parts you're changing so that you can uh, look at that and then how it correlates to activity and, and use that to really, uh, no pun intended, guide your process forward. And a question about the 4DMT clinical pipeline. You've, you've got, you showed us three different vector delivery routes. You could presumably design one capsid per delivery route, which is what you showed us. You could also presumably pursue multiple capsids that were really precisely narrowed down to cell type specificity. So how do you make that decision uh, uh, breadth versus precision, so to speak, in, in your pipeline? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. So we've built our pipeline up to date based on um, a validated vector for a particular organ or tissue, right? So that's our vector modularity approach. We feel like it's up to today, up to today is most efficient way to build the pipeline, right? Because once you have, it's, it takes a long time to discover something, right. and and then to show actually it's better than the conventional vectors. But once you have that validated with desired safety, so it's, that's really important, as well as desired delivery and transduction profile, we want to utilize that one vector, and and to identify diseases and and indications that we can utilize that vector again, again, again. So that's, that's how we build a whole ophthalmology profile. Your question about using different vector to target precisely different cell types within the tissue, that's a very good question. That might be the next step we will we'll take, right? So for example, you know, there are different cell types in the lung, right? And we wanna target basal cells and also target other epithelial cells, we may use you know, two vectors, and, and maybe the two vectors will deliver different cargoes as well, right? So I think we're thinking about um, that, maybe that's the next strategy that we're gonna go after. Yeah. A great question. Rudolph, I wanted to ask a bit about the, the alligator technology. Do you see chemical conjugation modifications as um, more impactful for the AAV field or more impactful for the LNP field? <laughs> I expect both. <laughs> uh, well, if we look at the LNPs now, it's, 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 it's ever more stringent than AAV. I mean, with LNPs, or at least the commercially available one, you can only retarget the liver. So any technology that will enable to redi redirect those LNPs to certain other tissue while you know, limiting the uh, hepatic uh, sequestration would be a game changer for, especially for gene editing, uh, where uh, you know most of the company developing really elegant gene editing technology 
uh, or you know, basically targeting ATTR or other uh, hepatic disease. Uh, so so that, that would be, a, I guess, critical if we can uh, confirm it. Now, we have seen that with AAVs, there's huge room for improvement. This is what, what 4DMT have been uh, able to demonstrate in, in, with their capsid in IVT. But, but many other applications, uh, you know, still targeting the muscle with AV is still, is still challenging. Uh, we have seen the issue with the toxicity and the dose to be administrated. So, you know, I think for both uh, viral and non-viral field, there's, there's enough room for many technologies on, on many improvements. Plenty of improvement to go around. I, I have one final kind of quick answer for each of you. Uh, and then if there's a question from the audience, we may have a few minutes for that. Share one lesson learned, the thing you wish you knew most before you started for the rest of the innovators in the crowd that might be earlier stage than you. You want me to start? Sure. Um, we wish we would know that um, it was challenging to convince people, to convince ourselves, and then convince potential partners and outside people that our new vector is actually better than the conventional vectors. You know, it, you know so is this based on in vitro data or non-human primate data or clinical data, right? So, um, you know, I, I think right now it seems like clinical data is really the game changer, but we wish we know, we, we knew that early on um, and to kind of like get the data package together as soon as possible. Uh, well, I'll add uh, the flip side to one of the things I, I did put in my talk. You know, I described how you want to develop your assays in the R&D world and then get them over to CMC and manufacturing. And, and so what uh, happened in one instance is that they really liked the assay and they took the scientist. So it, that, that meant I, I had to you know, hire someone back in as he had to go out to the CROs to, to get that. So get the assays and then transfer them before you lose a, a, key, a key scientist. That's, uh, you know, that, that's my, my <laughs> lesson from that. Yeah. Well, very simplistic way. Uh, uh, I wish I would have uh, raised uh, money in 2020 on a, <laughs> <laughs> a big round. That would have been easier at that time than it is now. Uh, we were not ready yet. We were already uh, at the infancy of the platform. That, that, that would have been a, a good way to accelerate uh, our, our development. A time machine should have been in your yeah. portfolio. <laughs> Are there any questions from the, in the audience? <laughs> They're supposed to have microphones, but maybe they don't. That's the it's shouted out. It's coming. The box is coming to you. Oh, these ones that you can throw. Yeah. Thank you, um, Faraz Ali, Tenaya Therapeutics. Um, excellent presentation. Excellent uh, format. Uh, I have a question for that's really directed at Anne, but really could be answered by anybody because all of you are knowledgeable on this. Sometimes in the process of making novel capsids, right, we have, we don't know exactly what we have until it's in humans, right? And because NHPs do not perfectly mimic the human immune system. And so we do a lot of direct, you know, capsid engineering for the heart. And I'm curious, Anne, you know, in the, in one of your programs, in the uh, Fabre program, that's one where there's been an unusually high rate of, you know, some adverse effects. And uh, I wonder how much, and, and that hasn't been seen with Sangamo's rival program in the same population with a different capsid. And, 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 and not smart people might come to the conclusion that maybe there's something in that novelty that is intersecting in a certain way with the Fabry patients. And I'm just curious, how do you tease that out? How in your approach of doing capsid engineering can you uh, eliminate some of these risks of the human immune reaction to the novel capsid? And what, what is your hypothesis of what's happening in the Fabry patients where there's a unusually high rate of some of these uh, complement activations and other reactions, even at low doses? That's a, that's a long winded question. <laughs> um, so I think it's really critical to think through the disease we're trying to tackle versus the capability of the delivery, right? So for example, you mentioned Fabry disease. It's a multi-organ disease. So the, 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 you know, the disease not only affects the heart, heart is the one that kills these, you know, kills these patients in the end but affects you know, other organs as well, like kidneys and cardiovascular um, uh, systems and all that. So 
um, we you know, didn't really have human data right, with C102. However, we did have a lot of non-human primates data. We have in, in vitro data as well. And the profile of the vector in terms of transducing different cell types and different organs match really well with the disease, right? Not only we can transduce heart cells, we can also transduce kidney cells and, and, and then um, uh, endothelial cells as well, right? So, you know, understanding that and having a good match is, is really what drives us to make a decision. This is a disease we want to go after with this vector. So I, I guess at, at the end of the day, once we get the clinical data, that's the final proof of the right decision. But I think before that, understanding that biology of the, of the disease and capability of, of your two is really critical. So I hope I answer your question somewhat. We can take it offline. <laughs> Thank you. Round of applause again, please, for our great panelists today. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes.